Hello and welcome to Ticker Risk and Compliance. Thanks to Six Clicks. Get started with your free account today and get on top of risk management and compliance for your business. Visit sixclicks.io. Now, today we're talking about cybercrime. And joining me is Six Clicks Chief Security Officer Andrew Robinson and journalist and writer for Six Clicks Media, Stephen Walter. Thank you both so much for your time today. Pleasure, Ash. Hi, now, Ash. I, Andrew, I might start with you. Could you take us through some of the recent cybercrime that's caught your eye? Sure. Well, uh, you say recent and that's meant to be a short list, but sadly it's a long list. Uh, but I'll try to uh, make it fast. So if we start locally, we can look at Uniting Care Queensland confirming that they feel, fell re victim recently to a cyber attack as recent as last week, rendering some of its systems inaccessible and Uniting Care Air Queensland, for those that don't know, provides aged care, disability, support, health care and crisis response services throughout the state. So the kind of service that you don't want to see disrupted but uh, gets caught up in, in ransomware. And uh, last month we saw Swinburne University of Technology also confirming that uh, personal information on staff, students and their external suppliers had inadvertently made itself public. And although it wasn't overly sensitive information, it does demonstrate the risks involved in using cloud services and not knowing how they handle your information. Interstate, we have Transport for New South Wales, confirmed in February that was it was impacted by a cyber attack, this time uh, based on a file transfer product known or made by Excelion. And that product we know is widely used in government and industry for allegedly securely transferring files, but in this case, maybe not so securely. Um, and then we have uh, maybe overseas, the Washington DC Police Department hacked from um, uh, data had started leaking online uh, last Monday after criminals cl claimed they had downloaded 200, 150 gigabytes of data and threatened to release that data if the ransomware demands hadn't been met. But the thing to note with that one is that it's a switch in tactics by uh, organised crime gangs operating online. So instead of holding your data and not releasing it until you uh, pay up the ransom. This time they're saying, okay, we'll release the data publicly and um, if you don't want us to, you have to pay. So it's a slight switch in tactics, which is quite astute because it picks up on the fact that government departments are perhaps um, all right taking backups of their data and able to recover it, but certainly don't want the embarrassment associated with that data being leaked online. And then a little further back in uh, the recent past, we have SolarWinds, a very big supply chain uh, attack that impacted a lot of US government departments and agencies, but also other entities around the world. And we have a weakness in Microsoft Exchange software that's used to transfer lots and lots of emails around the world. Uh, the on-premises software had a vulnerability that uh, allowed attackers to gain unauthorized access to information and networks. And really, other than ransomware, the big trend that uh, keeps on keeping on is really vulnerabilities in VPN clients. And this is software that the workforce uses to connect back to the business uh, remotely access to remotely access different business systems. And that's more prevalent in this work from home environment. So that's another big trend as well, Ash. Yeah, we, we do seem to hear a lot about the healthcare sector being targeted. Why is it such a lucrative and highly targeted area for cyber crimes? Sure, it's definitely up there in the stats uh, healthcare sector. So if the Australian Cyber Security Centre, the ACSC, maintains quite an informative 2020 health sector snapshot. And if you're in the health sector and practicing IT security or managing risk, then that's one to read for sure. It confirms that criminals view the aged care and healthcare sector as a lucrative target, as you say, and ransomware stats are, are just showing that uh, they've been uh, victimized by it. Um, and if we if we look at it, we might go, okay, they store sensitive personal and medical information, and that's true, but don't many other industries as well? 
So really the key differentiator around the healthcare sector is that it's so big, right? Uh, there are lots of uh, healthcare providers, there's lots of people involved, well-meaning um, people that have a positive view on the world and, and they can be exploited. All of the devices that are uh, associated with providing medical services, some of them aren't the standard operating systems that can be patched automatically. So all of these complexities in a healthcare environment both the scale and the brittleness of it just make it um, you know a real nice um, ground for uh, criminal organized gangs to find juicy vulnerabilities and and seek to exploit and extort them which is a real shame but something that hospitals and healthcare sector need to, to get on top of there's all these hopes and dreams and great potential for patient treatment and uh, through digital transformation but if we don't uh, keep on top of cyber security then it becomes a nightmare. Yeah, uh, Stephen, you would be hearing about this all the time, particularly now that Six Clicks is in the US, UK and India. What are business leaders saying about cybersecurity concerns so far this year? Yeah, uh, scale and brittleness. Thanks, Andrew. I'm going to steal that for my uh, next piece. Yeah, so we, um, we conducted some research uh, recently. So between that research and the other conversations, that we've just been having in general, we've found that their thoughts are pretty much in line. Uh, cyber security and cyber resilience is right up there, uh, number one and number two in many responses, which was great uh, to see. But um, if we pull focus a little bit further out, the good news is that uh, that all feeds into the official top 10 global business risks, which came out not that long ago. What's really interesting about that list is that the top three in that 10 are business interruption, pandemic outbreak, and cyber incidents. And those are the top three by far and away. The other seven are quite a ways down the priority list. Things like macroeconomics and political violence and natural disasters, as well as climate change, which was disappointing, uh, but understandable given that the pandemic's been hogging all the headlines, but that should correct itself. Um, so much so that the top three are now known as the COVID-19 trio, uh, which is thankfully not a terrible folk band at the pub on a Sunday afternoon, the COVID-19 trio, business interruption, pandemic outbreak and cyber incidents. The reason why it's good news uh, is because uh, the conversations we've been having, it's always coming up that those three risks are all really deeply connected to one another. Um, so to use cyber incidents as the connected to business interruption and pandemic outbreak, uh, the lack of incident response and preparedness like cyber resilience is what I mean demonstrates the growing vulnerabilities at a much, much larger threat landscape um, or surface area, as Andrew puts it, in what is now a much more intensely connected world online after our lives underwent that massive shift last year, thanks to pandemic outbreak that caused business interruption. So you see, uh, so to really addressing one is to at least make some good headway into addressing the other two. So that, that would be one of the, the, the main point that's come up in conversations lately. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, Cybersecurity attacks have been increasing for a little while now. So is this the main reason that we're seeing such a huge increase in attacks and I guess more coverage of it because everyone is now shifting online more post pandemic? Yeah, that, that's right. Uh, the massive shift, it gave us a big push. Uh, the pandemic into remote working, a, a huge benefit to society in my view um, and well overdue anyway. But we can't ignore all the exacerbated disadvantages, of course, right? Like digital inequality, um, which is a conversation for another time. Google it tonight if you want. Um, it'll fascinate you, but it will also break your heart. Um, but remote work, you know, COVID's taught us that we're even more dependent on that digital ecosystem now. It's dangerous, um, which, and it's left us wide open to make more mistakes ourselves, uh, which is a huge contributing factor to data breaches. Um, and for more extreme, more frequent attack scenarios like uh, cloud outages and huge data breaches. For example, one of our guests recently predicted that thanks to um, the access to those information systems at home and remote work, we're probably going to see a major cyber attack on the financial sector within the next six to nine months, which could potentially cause a liquidity crisis. And it's incredible that we are seeing this increase considering how much publicity cyber attacks seem to be getting at the moment. Yeah, that's right. Um, uh, something I, I can't quite shake that Andrew said to me was uh, to the tune of, we're all on the same network. 
um, citizens and businesses alike. It's the internet. Um, so a big mistake is to not keep that in mind. But it's tough because it's hard to... It's an arresting thought, right, trying to imagine the internet and its full presence and power in our lives and everyone we know around the world. So it's like trying to fully imagine a million years in evolutionary time. It's too much. So the pandemic has accelerated and broadened that for us. Now, Andrew, you're the chief security officer for a global tech solution for all of all of this. So what's your first go to recommendation for businesses? Because this would be incredibly overwhelming with businesses that are hearing some of these uh, statistics and some of these concerns. Sure. Well, usually, Ash, my, my go to number one recommendation is to is to look at what you have that needs protection and put a value on it, because that drives all the risk management practices to let you figure out how much should, should you, you know, spend in order to protect it and then how you should go about that. But really, my number one for today, um, and that's because I try to spread them around and pick a different number one every time because there is no silver bullet. Um, is uh, around accountability uh, because we need to hold uh, the companies that we do business with and consume services from uh, accountable uh, when they store our information. Uh, we need to hold the government accountable, um, at least as we can, uh, our elected representatives. And uh, we need the government to, to hold companies to account and they're doing that with regulation. We need them to, to to, to perhaps be more forceful when it comes to uh, implementing new and um, and uh, championing supportive cybersecurity supportive international law uh, norms and and, and laws um, and we're seeing that we're seeing them take a step forward uh, putting out regulations uh, for uh, sectors in Australia but we also need to, to see more from uh, government more progress. Uh, on the cybersecurity front, uh, because you, you're hearing it, about it on a regular basis. We all know about the problem, but there's obviously and evidently a whole lot more work to be done. Mm. And in terms of, I mean, we're speaking about putting pressure on government to be more accountable, but how do you do that with businesses? Sure. Well, uh, regulation's the number one way. So they can self-regulate and we can uh, try to influence them to do the right thing. But with uh, businesses, um, if they if they aren't uh, weighing up the value of the assets that they have uh, to the degree that we would want them to, and then uh, implementing the necessary cybersecurity, then regulation is unfortunately the next best instrument. And that's what the, actually what the government is already working through is which uh, which sectors represent uh, critical infrastructure or uh, sectors of significance, and then um, they're working with the relevant regulators to to up the ante in terms of the cyber security measures. So watch this space; we'll definitely have uh, a lot more to say about those sector specific uh, standards on on ticker as soon as more information comes to light. Mm. And Stephen, where do we go to now? in terms of the general public and businesses, can we work together to tackle this better and protect ourselves? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's plenty we can do and we're doing it right now. We're having a conversation in public about this and maintaining that public groundswell. Um, you know, just with this massive shift uh, that the pan pandemic has brought on, um, it's not our fault that we're a distressed workforce at the moment uh, and, and sort of uprooted. We're, we're all shaken and the Cyber criminals were, uh, they just followed us um, to this new norm or they were already there waiting for us and they just think that it's all too easy and um, that we weren't ready for it. Um, but there's plenty we can do about it. Uh, again, it's it's not our fault and it can be argued that it's not entirely business or government's fault that they don't have the right controls around that information and access either. When we're sitting here at home with access to confidential information and systems on unsecure networks, um, they certainly could have done better and be more prepared um, and they were given plenty of warning. We just weren't ready and that's okay and it's a board issue. The CEOs are responsible, board is accountable, but we can maintain cyber resilience and be able to detect, recover and respond and stop the spread of a cyber attack contagion and educate ourselves. We're all part of that cyber security together employees and business owners alike. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you both so much for your time today. You can, of course, learn more about our brand partner, Six Clicks, your operating system for risk and compliance. Head to sixclicks.io for more.